It's all very well to say we can have religion at the level of the citizenry, but as that transcends out of civil society and into the political sphere, it needs to become more and more indifferent uh, to religious commitment. Well, I'm sorry, politics draws from civil society, and those people aren't going to become more indifferent. The first is that if it involves strong establishment, it's incompatible with the dignity of the person, full stop, so we shouldn't do it. If a state were a just state, it would outlaw certain practices and certain teachings that belong to certain religious groups, like, for example, devil worshippers. Um, and, and once you've got a state doing that, it seems to me you've already got a state that is in some way establishmentarian. It really matters, I think, that Christ has claimed the good of religion because it takes it out of the hands of every state the church is not authorized. And right now, that is every single state in the world, right? I, so even on a kind of Pinkian um, political theology, uh, there is a really radical right of freedom of religion um, that's grounded in the dignity of the person. Precisely because the church has no longer authorizing states to use coercion in matters of faith. I'm Dr. John Pinero, Director of Research at the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. Welcome to a Collins Center debate on the question, should religion and government be separate? The goal of this conversation is to identify where the participants agree, identify any areas of disagreement, and clearly explain the reasons behind those positions. And I hope we can also demonstrate that debates like this uh, over important ideas not only deserve, but really need cordial dialogues in order to arrive at the truth of things. Our minds were made to seek and know the truth, and people of goodwill can agree on ends, but disagree in terms of the application of prudence and temperance and the achievement of those ends. So each speaker will have opening statements, followed by questions by myself, followed by the speakers questioning each other, and then we will do closing statements. I'd like to introduce our first speaker now, Dr. Sebastian Morello, who undertook his Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy at the Open University and his MA and PhD degrees in philosophy under the supervision of Sir Roger Scruton at the University of Buckingham. He specializes in how the Western intellectual tradition has shaped our political structures, societies, and cultures. Dr. Morello is the author of several books, including most recently, Conservatism and Grace, and also The World as God's Icon. And he has co-authored several other books on philosophy, history, liturgy, and education. He writes for various magazines and journals, for two of which he is the wine critic. He is senior editor and editorial board member of the European Conservative, to which he is also a regular contributor. He lives in Bedfordshire, England, with his wife and children. Dr. Morello? It's good to be with open. you. Thank you. Well, there are several assumptions presupposed by what I want to say today. Now, one may or may not agree with these assumptions, but it's necessary to declare them from the outset for the sake of clarity. So I take it as a given, and I think here Kevin and I will agree, uh, that human nature exists. We're not self-creating beings, nor can we change our nature. Moreover, there is a law of human nature with which we can seek to align our lives in our pursuit of flourishing, or indeed, by our own volition, we can depart from that law. The ways by which we may align ourselves with that law are diverse and dynamic, but such dynamism presupposes the acknowledgement of such law. I further take it as a given that political life, by which I mean the moral or practical ordering of our lives in community and its regulation through leadership and positive lawmaking, is proper to human nature. As individual persons, we emerge out of and naturally maintain corporate persons. Such communally reliant flourishing is not accidental to the kind of things we are, but rather it is proper to our nature. Humans are not found to be solitary, non-political animals anywhere on earth, 
nor have they ever been such. All philosophies that begin from the assumption that human beings are by nature solitary and merely opt into synthetic communities with accidental forms for some prior rationally apprehended reason are flawed in their first principle. Finally, I take it as a given that we are by nature question-asking and meaning-seeking beings, and hence we are religious by nature. We ask questions about our origin, our purpose, and our ultimate destiny, destiny, and we come up with workable answers to those questions. More importantly, we develop art, mythology, and ritual by which we both seek to embody our quest for meaning and seek some personal encounter with the god or the gods who form the object of our devotions. Religion is baked into our nature. Thus, because human beings are both political and religious by nature, there has never been such a thing as a secular society. Societies have always been religious. The moment society was declared secular in the 18th century by the French philosophes and their political activists, that society immediately erupted in a religious frenzy of sacrifice paraliturgical activity and the deification of the state as a new providential deity, with all the ritualistic expressions proper to religion subordinated to such anti-religious religiosity. Given that religion is natural to, to, to mankind and political government is the highest natural authority that exists over mankind, that is, mankind instantiated in his communities, nations, empires, etc. The proper authority over the religious life of any given natural community is its government. This fact has always been recognized, that the proper authority over the religious life of any given natural community is its government. The Roman emperor was arbiter over which were the public gods and which were the hearth gods, and eventually he even placed himself among the former. The Athenian statesmen were the protectors of religious life in their polis, and they lawfully executed Socrates for corrupting such religiosity among the young. The barbarian warlords of, of the north in Europe appointed their sacrificial priests and druids just as they appointed their lesser chieftains. Why then is it so alien to us to think of political leaders as the apposite authorities over the religious beliefs and practices of the citizenry? The answer, in my view, is simple. We are all stumbling about in the shadow of Christendom and simultaneously we are attempting to run on its fumes. Political leaders, as the highest authorities in any natural society, are the proper authorities over the religion of their people, which is always some manifestation of natural religion. In this, the age of our Lord Jesus Christ, however, supernatural religion has entered the world. Christians claim that their religion does not have its origin in the natural religious impulse of human nature, but has come into the world from without and in doing so has assumed into itself that natural religious impulse, has transformed it and superseded it. In short, Christians claim that their religion is not a natural religion, but a supernatural one. Thus, it requires an institution of purely supernatural origin to be both its interpreter and promulgator, namely the Christian priestly hierarchy. Political leaders whose role is rooted in the requirements of human nature are simply not competent to be the highest authorities over supernatural religion. Thus, in a Christendom model, we have two authoritative institutions on earth, one of natural origin, customarily called the state, and one of supernatural origin, customarily called the church. The terminology of church and state, however, is deeply misleading. States 
once they are political communities of Christians, are no longer merely natural communities. They are supernaturalized natural communities by virtue of the baptism of their members and the recognition of Christianity by their existent political and legal organs. Thus, in a Christendom model, what we customarily call church and state are more accurately called the, the spiritual and temporal divisions of the one supernatural community of Christians called the church. The monarch or prime minister or president of a Christian nation then is as much a leader in the church as any bishop, except as a layman, he is ordinarily competent in the temporal matters of that supernatural community and only extraordinarily competent in spiritual and doctrinal matters, whereas this is the reverse for a bishop. If the church's kerygmatic enterprise withdraws from the public arena or it is excluded from that arena by a political movement of apostasy, this has several harmful effects from a Christian perspective. First, the church atrophies as it cannot fulfill its own mission and it increasingly attempts to justify its own existence by presenting itself as a club committed only to temporal concerns within the jurisdiction of an increasingly anti-religious state. Second, this situation leads to a kind of moral schizophrenia among the baptised, especially baptised statesmen, who are expected to be Christians at home and secularists at work. Third, such an arrangement does not lead to what is widely claimed, namely a religiously neutral public arena. Given that, in such a case, the highest natural teaching authority, namely the state, refuses explicitly to recognise the imperatives of religion, its citizenry assume that it is rational, rational for their appetite for the infinite, if I may use that phrase, to be transposed onto finite objects. Hence, at best, an idolatry of consumerism takes over society, making its members shallow and corroding human culture. At worst, however, the natural religious appetite seeks satiation by a multitude of frustrated and chaotic pseudo-religious causes which erupt into the public arena. Political, ideological and social differences are then understood not as points for conversation and negotiation, but rather they are viewed through the prism of orthodoxy and heresy. This in turn leads to rapid political and social disintegration. As this disintegration unfolds, in its bid to maintain social stability, the state attributes to itself final authoritative judgment on religious and moral matters, just as it did in the pre-Christian age. It consequently emerges as a post-Christian counterfeit magisterium. Thus, the state makes claims about sex, marriage, family, selfhood, when innocent people can be killed, and progressively which opinions it is permissible to hold in one's cloistered conscience. The state increasingly interferes with every aspect of its citizens' lives, implicitly believing its own bureaucratic system to operate as a quasi-providential hand. The last three centuries of Western history have indeed provided ample examples of the state deifying itself, just as the pagan superpowers did in their most decadent epochs. The question, then, is not whether religion and government should be separate or admixed, since separation is in practice impossible. The question is, what kind of religion do we want our governments to endorse? Christians have always believed the devil's claim that all the kingdoms of this world belong to him, for which reason Christ called him the prince of this world and St. Paul called him the god of this world. Hence, Christians hold that the state will either be discipled and belong to the kingdom of Christ, a kingdom which doesn't have its origin in this world, or it will exist as a fiefdom of Satan's principality. Either way, it will possess one or the other's species of religiosity. That is why there is an imperative for Christians to make disciples of all nations.
Thank you very much, Dr. Morello. I'd like to now introduce our second speaker today, Dr. Kevin Vallier, who will give his opening statements before we get to questions. Dr. Vallier is professor of philosophy at Bowling Green University, where he directs their program in philosophy, politics, economics, and law. Dr. Vallier's interests lie primarily in political philosophy, ethics, philosophy of religion, in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, or PPE. He is the author of four monographs, five edited volumes, and over 50 peer-reviewed book chapters and articles. His books include Liberal Politics and Public Faith, Must Politics Be War, and others. And his new book, his newest book, addresses radical religious alternatives to liberalism and is entitled All the Kingdoms of the World. For more information, you can see kevinvallier.com or follow him at K Vallier on Twitter. Dr. Vallier, welcome. Well, thanks to you both for being here and to the Acton Institute uh, for hosting. And of course, everybody who's listening. Okay, so we're asking whether government and religion uh, should be separate. And I'm actually going to answer no in a way that might surprise people, but in a different way and for different reasons than Sebastian. Uh, before we do, I think just a few definitions and, and contexts. First, I'll just take uh, government to be the modern nation state. That's the context in which we operate. And then um, I'll not define religion exactly, but focus on Western religion. I think we'll talk a lot about Christianity tonight. Now, when we ask whether government and religion should be separate, I think we need to distinguish some context within which they might mix. So the first is going to be the level of the citizen, then the level of the legislator, and the third and final one is the question of what states uh, should say, what truths they should affirm, and then what values they should advance. So that's the question of establishment of religion. Now, my position at the level of the citizen has long uh, been clear in my work. There's a common trope in the socialist and liberal traditions that people should privatize their faith in politics, keep their religion out of their politics. I think there's no good argument. Uh, for this view. I think people have a moral freedom to bring their religious convictions to bear in their political lives in many ways. That's freedom of speech and freedom of the press, the freedom to vote for religious reasons in the ballot box, uh, the freedom to uh, campaign and run for office based on religious considerations and to form religious political parties. Now, the level of the legislator is more complex because the legislators have a duty to represent the views and values of their citizens. However, I think that legislators have something very much like uh, the kinds of religious freedom that citizens have, with one important exception. I do think it's essential that legislators not rely on reasons of revelation alone, but that they also to appeal to considerations of natural law, natural reason, which I, I sometimes call public reason, but we can talk more about that. So the thought here is that legislators should uh, appeal to considerations that people can grasp apart from revelation. Um, and, and we can understand that, in my view, as natural law. Now, at the level of establishment, um, I'm not going to argue against symbolic establishment. Um, I'm not going to say that we should uh, strip in God we trust off coins or ban a beautiful Anglican coronation liturgy. Uh, but I am concerned with two further levels of establishment, what I'll call moderate and strong. So moderate establishment is characteristic of the forms of establishment we see in Europe. There, the only kind of religious coercion it uses is that which is characteristic, say, of the taxing power. Much of what we see are, say, symbolic establishment combined with public spending. So uh, the state might build churches and hire priests or build schools, hire teachers, uh, even set curriculum for those schools. But that's about all they do, depending on the model. Strong establishment, though, is uh, more akin to what we see, say, in Iran and Saudi Arabia. What is added to establishment um, the, of the moderate variety is the claim that the state should act through direct and indirect coercion in order to secure spiritual goods. So they might, for instance, in an extreme case, whip a blasphemer or, uh, say, ban heretical books so people don't get the, the wrong spiritual idea. So tonight I'll make two contentions. The first is that strong establishment is unjust. And the second is that moderate establishment probably doesn't work. So strong establishment is wrong. Uh, moderate establishment is of dubious effectiveness. Now, why think that strong establishment is unjust? What well, rests on a widely held moral principle that I myself think is part of natural law, which is the existence of a universal right 
of religious freedom. This is a right that everyone has uh, to organize their individual and social lives around their religious convictions. That includes freedoms of speech, press, assembly, freedom of association uh, in terms of churches and schools, and of course the sacred rights of parents to pass their uh, faith on to their uh, children. Now, in a short uh, format, uh, establishing that something's part of natural law is difficult, but one way to go is to appeal to the widespread agreement of different moral communities to make the case that they have a common rational apprehension. So I'll distinguish three different groups. First, I think it's useful to go back to the lead up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which the United Nations uh, passed in 1948. There was a kind of two-year uh, period in which they were uh, composed, and at the end there was dramatic agreement um, on uh, the articles as a whole, but in particular Article 18, which protects a universal right of religious freedom. And at that time, it's really quite striking that China and India, the United States, England, numerous richly Catholic countries could agree, regardless of their religions, traditions, and histories. Jacques Maritain, the great Catholic theologian and philosopher who was an observer at the formulation of the Universal Declaration, said we couldn't agree on the reasons for the rights. But we could agree on the rights. And this suggests to me a kind of joint mutual apprehension or moral apprehension of a deeper moral truth, that all of these different people were able to come together from different perspectives and see much the same thing. Now, my second moral community, and that's just most human beings. It's hard to find a good global polling on support for freedom of religion. Um, but Pew did a poll in 2019 that found among 34 different nations that um, religious freedom had a great deal of support. So uh, on average, 68% of people said that it was very important to them to have freedom of religion in their society. And these countries are very diverse, Indonesia, India, Brazil, the United States, and so on. Now my third moral community, which I think is especially impressive, which is Christians. Uh, the Protestants have long uh, acknowledged to some degree a universal right of religious freedom. Um, uh, my fellow Eastern Orthodox um, have been a little slow getting there, but you know, being slow is kind of our thing. <laughs> um, um, and with a little waffling we can talk about among the Russians. Um, but um, the most surprising communion in some ways is the Roman Catholic Church, given uh, not only its extensive dogmas, but its practice of strong establishment, including the Pope being an actual temporal sovereign. And yet, as we know, um, at the end of the Second Vatican Council, uh, the Church promulgated a document, Dignitatis Humanae, its statement on universal uh, religious freedom. And there, as I read it, it's clear as a bell, the human person has a right to religious freedom. They are to be immune from coercion by individuals, groups, or any human power, and that that right is grounded in the dignity of the person as made in God's image. The church then goes on to lay out liberty after liberty and right after right. Uh, it's nothing short uh, of extraordinary. Now, I should be clear, they're only trying to rule out strong establishment. They are very clear there's still the duty of societies to the true religion. Other forms of establishment are still on the table. But if Dignitatis Humanae is doing anything, it's setting strong establishment aside. And on the overwhelmingly dominant interpretation of Dignitatis Humanae, it's setting them aside for good. Okay, so let's back up and look at Christians and then at the general moral communities I cited. It's amazing to me that the three great Christian traditions, Protestantism, Catholicism, and Orthodoxy, reasoning under the twin lights of nature and grace, were able to come to such an extraordinary agreement. And that's an agreement they share with many different peoples all around the world, and of course, moral deliberators uh, in the formation of the Universal Declaration. And so I conclude there very probably is a universal right of religious freedom. Since it conflicts with strong establishment, I conclude that it's unjust. Now to my more uh, minor contention, that moderate establishment is of dubious effectiveness. Here, um, you do have to get in the empirical weeds, but there are different uh, communities of people, of social scientists, that study the effects of establishment and the, the nature of secularization. And there's a lot of disagreements between them. So for instance, economists tend to stress uh, the religious marketplace, right? The loss of competition, there'll be more piety. Um, the, uh, Political scientists and sociologists have been trying to push kind of new and more sophisticated secularization theses. 
Uh, and one point of agreement, though, despite all their disagreements, is that moderate establishment doesn't seem to do much good. The economists say it does more harm than good because it makes priests lethargic and corrupt. The political scientists and sociologists think, well, that can happen too, um, but the forces of secularization are just too strong. Moderate establishment won't be enough, even if strong establishment would matter. So the general thought here is that there seems to be a general consensus that the positive effects of moderate establishment are just unclear from the data. And my view is if we uh, go to the rigmarole, through the rigmarole of tax and spend, we better be sure we're not harming the church. And so for me, the thought is just empirically, this is something where we should take great, great care. Okay, so let me back up. Should government and religion be separate? At the level of the citizen, absolutely not. I hope that people will bring their religious convictions to bear on their politics, and that includes Christians now more than ever. The same thing is true of the legislature. So long as legislators respect uh, people by appealing to natural law when proposing in particular course of legislation. Note tonight, I haven't argued against strong establishment. Indeed, um, many in the liberal tradition have been on both sides of that question. Uh, but I have argued pragmatically against moderate establishment, which is that it doesn't work very well, or not very clearly. Um, and I've argued that strong establishment is simply unjust. Thank you, Kevin. It seems to me that both of you have, both of you have in common uh, what we find in Dignitatis Humanae, which has now worked its way into the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is that namely that the religious, our religious response is a natural response, and this is one reason then why why the state can't can't remove that. Right? This is this is in our nature to seek these things, so that yes. religious freedom flows from our dignity. But I do have a question for both of you, and this has to do with what Jacques Martin said, because while Kevin was speaking, I was thinking of this already, and he said. You know, as long as we don't talk about the foundations of that Declaration of Human Rights, that's okay. But I'll present a different way of looking at that than one that's as positive maybe about natural law as, as, as you said, Kevin. And that is that you look where we are now, where the World Health Organization in conjunction with several UN agencies and the World Bank has promulgated a 210 page abortion guidelines mm -hmm. document promoting that as a fundamental human right. And so that would, would, when you leave the foundations of dignity undefined, then you leave it open to define it however you would like it. And then when you have a strongly established, let's say secular state, I think to your point, Dr. Morello, that you, you're, you're going to have a religion whether you like it or not, right? There's gonna be an established something on, on the part of the state. So I, I guess my question to both of you is, uh, uh, in terms of a, in terms of establishment, strong, moderate, weak, establishmentarian position, how exactly do we draw the lines? Uh, secularism. I don't think anyone at this table would would think that secularism is neutral. That's 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 a falsehood, right? It isn't neutral. It isn't neutral in law. Uh, but but so every state is religious. But where do we where do we draw the line then? This is especially difficult, I would say, with the legislator. So the citizen becomes the legislator in a republic. Now, maybe this is easier in a different polity than a republic. But where, where does that religion stop? Is, is natural law the only appeal we can make? We can't make an appeal to revelation in the public square? Well, the, 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 if I may, I mean, the, this is where I think uh, Kevin and I might, might have a slightly different perspective because um, if, if you... If you believe that human nature has some inherent defect, that it is fallen, um, then uh, you're, you're going to end up with quite a pessimistic view regarding the degree to which we can apprehend the content of the natural law. Now, there's been ongoing discussion about um, the degree to which we can consistently do that. Some theologians uh, and, and natural philosophers have said, well, uh, even the, the pagan can easily and consistently um, uh, comprehend uh, first order natural law, even if in second order natural law, things get fuzzier. Um, others have said, uh, and certainly Augustine thought, well, no, you, can't, you, you cannot expect people to consistently do that. Now, who knows? But in any case, it seems to me that the 
the post-Christian human being is not the same kind of creature as the, the, the pre-Christian uh, human being who is providentially through prevenient grace being prepared for evangelization through uh, Hellenic wisdom and Roman law and the emergence of nations and so on. The, 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 the post-Christian human being has gone through the experience, uh, at least in his induction in civilization, of being uh, a possessor of grace and has abandoned it. And now, uh, and there's proof of this everywhere around us, and now sees um, the effects of grace as almost exclusively as limitations on his liberty and freedom. And so with that is going to be not just uh, an increasing inability to comprehend first order natural law, but a hatred of first order natural law as the very thing that will limit our agency and our self-realization, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it, it seems to me that um, we need to be very careful, one with an overly optimistic or positive anthropology, uh, but, but also uh, with, um, uh, with developing a kind of what people call, you know, two-tier Thomism, seeing nature as complete in itself and then grace is something plonked on top. No, grace is something that comes and invades nature precisely to bring it to completion um, and to heal it. Uh, so that's, that's what, what I would say to that. So just let me clarify, uh, clarify the question a bit. Is, is the worry something like... Um, there's always some form of establishment or that there's, there's perhaps no alternative to it or something along those lines, just trying to make, to be clear. So I, I the, Dr. Merle's point about um, uh, a post-Christian society is, is a good one in, in getting at this. So we're post-Christian, and if we, are, if we are indeed on the fumes of Christian society, T.S. Eliot was talking about this way back in the 1920s, saying, saying this, this is what we're doing. At some point, we just kind of run out because you can't run on fumes forever, although many of us would like to try in our, in our cars, right? Uh, but uh, so that's a different case altogether than the preparatory Period. So how then do we get to the point where the, the kinds of things that we think are available in the natural law that are written on the heart, such as, let's say, not murdering, right? And yet where the state is legislating that there's certain people we can murder, innocent people. It's legislating against natural communities like the family, the smallest natural community, which even the pagans re recognize, right? When Aristotle's talking about we're creatures of the polis, et, et, et cetera, right? We're, we can't give birth to ourselves and nature speaks to the very fact that we're born in, in community. So if the modern state is legislating against those, against those things, the, the question becomes if, if, if human dignity is being rooted in a natural law that is buried so deep that our legislators can't find it, or they hate it, or they respond aggressively against it because it's buried, but they know it's there. And this explains sometimes the, the vocal, violent, publicly uh, kind of uh, performative rage response against these things. Uh, then, uh, then what hope have we to restore or build a Christian polity? So I guess I want to say a couple of different things. I think there's oftentimes uh, among Christians the sense that um, knowledge of natural law has been just totally lost, say, over the past 50 to 70 years or a great degree. And I think, unfortunately, that ignores the concrete accomplishments of protecting natural law that have occurred during that time as well. We are much better in the treatment of women. We are much better in the treatment of racial minorities. I think we are much better at taking care of the poor. Um, I think we're much better at respecting freedom of religion. Um, and so I just don't have the view that having a post-Christian society has led to an on balance, right, knowledge of natural law. There are a lot of natural laws, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm just not convinced. I'd also say even in the most secular societies, I mean, they do seem to have some really deep set grasp. Um, about how to treat individuals, how to value them, their worth, about how to care for them and support them. Um, so I guess I'm just not convinced to be a natural law pessimist until I was really able to sort of stack up um, what's, what's been gained and what's been lost in that, in that time. It's certainly the case international institutions have become much less representative of, of the world. 
Um, and so, yes, they've, they've tended to trend very far left, whereas after the Second World War, there was a much more ecumenical spirit. Um, and so, yes, I mean, today the international institutions, I think, have have become um, sort of unsynced. And, but that's, I think, primarily a kind of elite dynamic, which we can, we can talk more about. Um, but I don't see it as a dynamic that is pervading all of humanity. And this leads to my second point, which is that <clears throat> when we're talking about apprehensions of natural law, we can't just restrict ourselves to a Christian context. We can't just limit ourselves to Christian countries. Indeed, um, <clears throat> if we look across the world, we look at um, the Muslim world or uh, East Asia, um, we do here, of course, find uh, a great deal of recognition and adherence to natural law. They're not really any worse at this, from what I can tell, than Christians for the most part. There are some exceptions. It seems to me like our understanding and our realization of an ultimate morality um, is actually not in such bad shape, and it's not even in that bad of shape outside countries that have ever been Christian. And I think that's a very good sign for natural law. This isn't a, a criticism of Christianity, but it's a way of glorifying God that we can see, oh, wow, our recognition of the moral order really has stood up over time. Yes, there are some things that we forget, um, but there are other things that we start to really get right. I, I have to um, call your optimism into question a little bit. Um, uh, it, it, it seems to me that we are not treating the poor better. I mean, I, I've been amazed uh, walking around European and American cities recently. Seems that every uh, every second or third person is homeless, and um, and it's not clear where they can go. I mean, we we actually used to have an infrastructure largely held up by the church to support such people. Um, Whereas, whereas it's, it seems that an extraordinary number of, of people in late modern capital, capitalistic societies are falling through the net, as they say. It's not clear to me that we are, say, less racist. We're just changing the way in which we conduct a racist discourse. Um, uh, in fact, the, ver the, the very fact that it has become popular in the United States uh, to say that it is impossible to be racist towards people of European uh, heritage, for example, uh, and, and for people to increasingly talk about things like white fragility and white supremacism and so on. This is, this is uh, to take the evils of the world and place them on skin pigment. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't seem that we're becoming less racist. We're just changing the terms of ra racist discourse. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that we're treating women any better. Um, you know, the, the, to, it, it would be unthinkable to most of our forefathers that a society would not only decriminalize, but perhaps hold up as virtuous, say, the abandonment of women and children or the encouragement of women to, um, uh, to, to, to kill their children out of convenience. Um, this, is, this is not uh, indicative of a society that holds women in high regard. Uh, and now, of course, we're moving into the total commodification of women where uh, we're creating um, businesses of womb hiring and womb renting so that people can have uh, uh, children if they think that's part of their own personal self-realization. This is not indicative of a new understanding of the dignity of women. Um, moreover, it seems to me that a lot of uh, societies that don't have a Christian pedigree um, are seriously struggling when it comes to the level of uh, human dignity. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Asia where um, life often seems extremely cheap. And, uh, and of course, in places like uh, China, there has been an ongoing program of almost total dehumanization. So uh, I think we have to be um, a little bit cautious with, with such optimism. So Kevin, I mean, I think, so the commodification of the human person, uh, and other things that Dr. Morello has mentioned, I mean, which slavery is commodification, yep. and we're doing way better. Are yes. we? Uh, yes. 
And I also think, I mean, on, on slavery, yes, the, the widespread nature of slavery, slavery has been largely abolished. Um, I would also argue that we can't ignore bans on marital rape, the reduction of child marriage, um, the gradual suppression and reduction of FGC, which I don't know if I should spell out. Um, welfare state coverage is better in lots and lots of different countries. And that's pretty easy to see. There are some places where, where say, you might think welfare states have gotten a little weaker uh, in a couple of different respects. Um, if you want to follow a certain kind of left-wing economic narrative, but I'm not sure that's really true uh, either. I'm not sure the the <clears throat> welfare state helps the poor as much as it well, you, can you, hurt them in, in you, the long run. You may right? you may disagree with that, although um, I'm not sure Seb Sebastian would. That would be interesting. Um, longevity is doing better. Nutrition is doing better. Starvation is lower. Our ability to protect people. Um, or willingness to protect people from disease. Um, so I just think if you look at the empirical work on measures of human development and measures of protections of human rights, we're doing a lot better than we have in the past. The one exception that I will grant is the abortion issue. That's something on which I think we're doing quite a bit worse than in the past. Um, and it's a big issue, um, I'll, so I'll acknowledge that. But this, I think, fits with my broader point that we're doing some things better that are big deals, Right. And we're doing at least one thing much, much worse. But also, I mean, just on the, the treatment of uh, on race, I mean, just any of the measures of racial stigmatization and they're all pretty clear. So, you know, I understand kind of appealing to experience, but I think there's too personal experience. But I think there's maybe too much focus um, again on just the downsides where the measurable upsides are, are really considerable. So we can't we can't get to the the source of all those upsides here, but it, it, it does. It does make me think about the, the uh, you mentioned the plurality of nations in the world and even non-Christian nations and the grasping or not grasping uh, the natural law. Uh, but when we're talking about these welfare states as well that you mentioned, we're primarily thinking about post-Christian countries and what had been Christendom and there's established welfare states to different degrees. And yet the farther north we go in Europe, uh, the more dismal the ennui is and the suicide rate, et cetera. And yet the, the welfare states are great. We're kind of comfortable. We're comfortable in these societies and yet somehow uncomfortable, too anxious about the future to have children, for instance. Well, uh, that's not true of, of those states, though. It, it, uh, interestingly enough, um, it's the Nordic states, for example, that are having the most children in <clears throat> Europe. So uh, whilst they, they are, are also they also have a terrible suicide rate. Um, they are having far more children than, I mean, the historically very Catholic countries like Italy and Spain, um, they, they, you know, they are about to enter a demographic crisis that will probably see the, the indigenous population. So how do we measure that then if we think about, so if we were to bring in the integralists for a moment who are, of course, on the strong side, right? So they... Those who want integralist Catholic states because they think it could end the demographic winter in these countries, or even in the United States without immigration, right? We'd have a negative, negative replacement rate. Um, those don't seem to have fared very well in the real world. I mean, maybe this is the ideal bar bashing up against the, the well, real world, but those are precisely former well, integral Catholic states. It's complicated. Of course. Because both... both both the Nordic countries and the historically very Catholic countries have both gone through the same process of secularization. They are both largely atheist uh, states. The, the, the big difference between them uh, is that um, one has a historical uh, welfare settlement and the others don't. So, so when, when uh, for, for, for you know, centuries now, if you had children in Northern Europe, um, the state was very good at stepping in and taking care of those children, uh, either for you or with you. Uh, in, in Italy and Spain, there was a culture of, um, uh, of, of family support. You had large families and families all got involved in the, in the raising of the children. As, as these uh, nations have been secularized, which has, as is uh, uh, understandable, um, 
has coincided with family breakdown um, and fragmentation. Uh, what, what has happened is that the stakes are very high if you have children in, in Spain or Italy because the state's not going to step in and the family has already broken down and fragmented. Uh, in, in Northern Europe, you can continue to have children and the state steps in. So, but on both, in both of these populations, the, uh, the, the, the rate is, is dropping, the number of children is dropping. It's just the process is slower where the state can step in. And let me I, say I something else. Comment, but I'd rather have oh, you. Uh, just yeah, something yeah. else positive about, I mean, the Nordics. Um, human rights protections, democracy, public health, higher social trust, um, all of these things are in really, really good shape. And these are post-Christian societies. So again, you know, how do you, how do you look at that? And post-Christian societies with established <clears throat> state churches as well. Yes, although, I mean, I think as we understand, these aren't exactly functionally Christian uh, I mean, that's that's the question about establishment, yeah. isn't well, it? Well, right? it is. The, it the is. Christian it society is. with an established yeah. I mean, all, I, all I just wanted to say about this is we can look at non-Christian societies or post-Christian societies holding on to the recognition of at least some parts of natural law, not as an argument against Christianity and Christianity in public life, but an argument in its favor. Wow, look how much... God has helped us to retain what's actually morally required of us, in particular when there's this really strong secularizing elite force um, uh, in a variety of different respects. So, again, I just wanted to stress that once we take a broader view, both internationally and in terms of the full range of natural laws, I think it's really hard to say we're doing worse on balance. Well, that's, I mean, that's more a, a question of um, w whether we should be... Um, optimists or pessimists about um, the, the arc of history, um, w which uh, is an interesting conversation, uh, but I think it takes us slightly away from the, the topic, sure. which, which is the relationship between politics. I mean, if we should so ask the question again, should religion and state be separate? So in, in some of these cases, in many of them, the modern states with established churches, Church of England, in the UK, the Cypriot Orthodox in Cyprus, the Church of Denmark in Denmark, uh, and, and also in the, the, the New World states, right, Argentina. The country's Catholic, but not the state. I mean, there's all kinds of gradations the way you can spell this out. So you think about a, a Christian people in a state without an established church or a post-Christian people in a state that has an established church. Does it matter in the 21st century, the establishment or not? Forget, forget the ideal, I guess, for, for a moment. Like, like, should it be? Well, if it's the 13th century and you have this natural kind of integral state because there's so many Christians and, of course, the king's going to be promoting that and it, it all works together because it's a Christian culture that's producing this, that's one thing. But if uh, politics downstream from culture and the culture is no longer Christian, then... How do, you, how do you see this dynamic, I guess? It's kind of a real-world question in our last... Actually, we have about a minute left on this portion before you question each other. Oh, dear. Well, here's something to just point out, you know, um, uh, very, very quickly, which is that uh, the point I made earlier is that you, we've got these, you know, different theorists of secularization and establishment. And I think there is, again, broad but not total agreement that these forms of moderate establishment are not actually helpful. Strong establishment can work. I don't want to deny that. I just think it's unjust. Um, um, it worked for communists. This, this seems it? to be pretty anemic. Um, um, in many cases, the churches have been sort of captured by non, effectively non-Christian forces. So they're humanitarian institutions, is it? Or, or what do you mean by that? Oh, I just mean the actual established churches, clergy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's yeah. right. I mean, the, the, the trouble that we're facing, it seems to me, <clears throat> I live in one of these establishmentarian countries, um, and w what we have emerging are is is not so much the secularization of the state and then pockets of people who are enjoying their own religious liberty. We have competing integralisms essentially mm -hmm. that 's what we 've ended up with so and this this ought not to surprise us you know in in the uh, in London, in various cities uh, around uh, England, um, where there are very large numbers of Muslims, for example, they want um, the local council to be predominantly Muslim. And so now you have Muslim boroughs in cities. Um, and what they essentially want is their religious commitments 
um, realised at the level of, of local government, right? They want their religion politicised. And why should this surprise us? We do exactly the same thing, right? Um, uh, you know, when, when I have to vote, I look around for either somebody who is a practising Roman Catholic or has a set of commitments that largely correspond or are close to my commitments as a practising Roman Catholic. So I want my religion to find expression at political level as well. And this seems to be uh, one of the the tensions, uh, I won't say the flaws, I think that would be too too much, but one of the tensions in in Kevin's account that it's all very well to say we can have religion at the level of the citizenry, um, but as the, as that transcends out of uh, civil society and into the political sphere, um, somehow it needs to become more and more indifferent uh, to religious commitments. Well, I'm sorry, politics draws from civil society and those people aren't going to become more indifferent, hopefully. Um, and so you're always going to get uh, religion uh, at, at the level of... Um, of politics, and then the question is, do you want this situation of a fragmenting society through competing integralisms, or do you want a country that says it makes a distinction between public and private religion? Kevin, Was that, that your sounds first like question a question. I, I think that is. Oh, I think it worked, worked its we, way right into we, uh, uh, right into a question for you. All right. So there's. Um, I even changed the timer. There's a number of things that I want to, um, I think, say on this because it's a very uh, important uh, issue. First, this question of moving into more forms of establishment, right? Can the religious citizen, uh, the piety kind of work its way up in the state? Well, I think in the legislature, I've said that that was fine um, and that it can, and I think that it will. Um, but the question about whether it should start to transform other institutions that have certain measure of coercive power, I think is um, one that is ultimately an empirical question. And I do think the balance of evidence suggests that, um, you know, looking again at the evidence from political science, sociology, and economics, um, that uh, it just doesn't work very well. So I'm not actually making a, a principled argument tonight against it. I'm just saying, look, we look at the world and we don't just don't see a lot of good. Now, this argument that, okay, well, it's ultimately got to kind of remake the state such that we have competing integralisms. I want to say two things. Um, the first is that if it involves strong establishment, it's incompatible with the dignity of the person, full stop. So we shouldn't do it. We have to deal with the consequences of, of, of living in a more, ju and more just world in, ver in that particular sense. Um, but I also wanted to speak to this issue about um, competing integralisms, because I think this is a bit like the argument, what I like to call um, the no alternative uh, argument that uh, there's always an established religion of some kind. Mm -hmm. And um, here's generally what I think uh, ab about this. this is the argument I think trades in two important ambiguities. The first ambiguity is what kind of establishment that we're interested in. And the second ambiguity is what kind of thing must we establish, <laughs> right? Now, I've just distinguished between kind of two ideal types, right? Um, strong establishment with direct and indirect coercion or moderate establishment with funding. Of course, there's a variety of intermediary positions. So when we're asking, okay, well, what's the alternative to establishment? Well, what kind do you mean, right? The other ambiguity is what is it that we have to establish, right? So suppose we just say religion. Well, there are thousands of them. So which one do we have to go for? What's also the case is that in these discussions, people often say that, oh, well, look, liberalism's a religion or something like that. You haven't put it that way tonight. But um, what we can say is these are ideologies, even if they're not religions, they're similar. Um, and so now our question is, okay, um, what is the no alternative objection? Here's maybe four ways of trying to think about it. Is there no alternative to strong establishment of religion? Well, that seems false because you've had strong establishment of ideology. Um, is there an alternative to moderate establishment of religion? Well, we could have moderately established ideological states. Um, so what exactly is the argument going to be um, that there's no alternative to establishment of religion and or ideology? One thing that we can do in looking at strong establishment is just look at countries that don't have a lot of strong establishment at all. Um, and the nice thing about this is we actually have some empirical data that Pew has uh, a really nice uh, yearly 
um, Religious Freedom and Restrictions Report, um, where it rates different countries along two different uh, dimensions. On the one hand, they rate government restrictions, that is direct governmental controls, and the other is a social hostilities index. That, to what extent do like individuals and in civil society kind of uh, attack people? Um, and what I want to say is that there is an alternative to establishment for many of these countries in any substantive or robust sense. So countries, for instance, like Japan, uh, New Zealand, uh, Ireland, actually, Chile, Estonia, and Taiwan, um, they all do really, really well on um, in the Pew Report. They both do very well with respect to low social hostilities, and they do very well with respect to government restrictions. And so I think the thought is, well, there's no alternative to what strong forms of establishment. I don't really see it in these countries. I see something more akin to, say, moderate establishment of religion and or ideology. But then I think the no alternative objection has become something that's almost banal, right, that very few people would deny that states have to do things to transmit certain shared values and norms over time. So my issue with the competing integralism's point is that, well, it depends on the kind of establishment and it depends on the kind of religion or ideology. And that once we've sort of sorted through those different versions of the claim, I think we'll see on the one hand um, the claim is false, or on the other hand it's historical circumstances. So. Um. Am I, uh, should I answer that, or am oh, I now sure, oh, you're sure, asking you're me questions? Sure, yeah. back and forth and question, yeah. yes. Well, well, yes. Well, so, yeah. Well, how would you prefer to do this? Uh, 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 I, I just drill, or do you, yeah. do you want to do you want to discuss? <laughs> you, you, you ask what you you ask what you like. He'll answer, and okay. I'll join in if need be. Fine, because um, uh, I do have things to say in response to that, but perhaps I'll do that later then. Um, it's, it, so it seems to me that uh, you uh, make um, a very uh, firm point uh, that, that is that is there is this thing called strong establishment, and strong establishment does not allow for religious freedom, and therefore because religious freedom or religious liberty is one of the basic rights that human beings are due, it is per se unjust uh, and. Um, ought to be forbidden. And it seems to me that historically that doesn't play out, precisely because you can have what you call strong establishment and simultaneously uh, have religious liberty as long as you accept the, um, the, the private religion, public religion distinction. So, um, you, you know, you, you had, for example, Roman Catholics in England uh, practicing their religion. Um, uh, you had a number of emancipation acts that al allowed that to be freer. You have the whole dissenter tradition in England, but there was an established church and, and you simply could not hold certain positions in public life, or you couldn't have the privilege of, say, going to Oxbridge if you didn't conform to that public religion. But that didn't mean that there wasn't some degree of religious liberty. They just made this private public distinction. Now, uh, historically different, if you want to use this term, integralist countries have worked this out differently. Um, famously, the church issued this document early on, Sicut Judeus Non, saying, you know, the, the Jews are not to be harassed. They are to have their synagogues, you know, and, and made a, a number of provisions, but insisted that that didn't make it a public religion. Um, I don't know, you have in, in Poland, you have the, the the, the Polish Tatars who have been there since the 16th century, all of whom are Muslim, um, and, and they were great heroes uh, of, of Poland. And, and uh, amazingly, you know, some Tatar generals led Polish armies against the Ottomans, for example. Um, so, uh, but Roman Catholicism was always the, uh, the, the public religion of the Kingdom of Poland. So there seems to be this tradition it, within, Christi, uh, within Christendom, let's put it that way, um, of having strong establishment and religious liberty. Okay, so, I mean, the Christian tradition, I think, is having, say, strong establishment in, this, in a sense 
um, the principles of Christian tradition, at the very least, are having strong establishment in the sense that the state has some authority given by the church over the baptized, right? Um, and so in principle, right, the strongly established states are not sort of restrict the liberties or kind of mess with those that are unbaptized, mm -hmm. right? That, because, I mean, uh, it, strictly speaking on the way I've understood strong establishment in terms of using direct and indirect coercion, what you're describing is just less coercion. Um, so I think by strong establishment, we mean something like coercion of the baptized. Um, and I think there are a couple of, of difficulties uh, here. The first is that the protection of religious minorities does not actually look very good in these societies. You brought up, I think, the papal states, the treatment of the Jews there. And prep for the debate, I actually was reading a good thing ab about this. And for about 300 years, with the maintain, uh, maintenance of the Jewish ghettos, uh, Jews suffered horribly and were horribly mistreated. In fact, it took until the Italian unification forces in around 1870 to even stop that. Um, you know, it's funny when I talk about these kind of integralism issues, it's always my Jewish friends that are the most afraid and the most outraged because I think precisely our best record of how integral states or anything like it operate with respect to religious minorities is the history of how we've treated the Jews. <laughs> and it isn't good. And I don't understand uh, how any strong establishmentarian is going to be able to put those kind of worries uh, at ease, given the history. Sorry, just, just to be clear, I, I didn't bring up the papal states, and um, uh, and I agree with you yeah. uh, about the, tr the, the, the unhappy uh, history of the treatment of the Jews. Uh, I, what I said was that early on in the church's history, it issued the, the declaration, Sicut Judeus Non, it, that that also happens to be, I think, in many ways, one of the most um, violated documents or teachings uh, in, the, in the history of the church, including by uh, the rulers of the papal states. Uh, my, my point is that this was a, a principle that was issued and not seen to be incompatible with establishmentarian Christianity, even if it's been uh, undermined at times. Okay, yeah, I mean, the issue there is there's the principle and then there's... Yeah, the exactly, practice. yeah, exactly. Um, so I just think strong establishment with uh, over Christians and lots of protections for religious minorities is just not a historical reality. That's my answer. Fine. Um, it seems to me that you, there, there are two ways of using strong establishment here. One is that the state uh, coerces only the baptized toward small low orthodoxy um, uh, as, as the temporal arm of the church. Um, the other is that it protects the true, what it deems to be the true faith from being undermined by uh, competing religions that it, that it um, either is prepared to tolerate as private religions or uh, condemn as uh, noxious. Now, it seems to me that there are some religion, uh, religious commitments that um, that a just state would have to um, would have to condemn. Um, so, if you if you if you had I don't know uh, devil worship or something like that, um, that that was undermining of the flourishing of the citizenry in all sorts of ways, um, that, that if a state uh, were a just state, it would outlaw certain practices and certain teachings that belong to certain religious groups, like, for example, devil worshippers. Um, and, and once you've got a state doing that, it seems to me you've already got a state that is in some way establishmentarian. I mean, to some degree. So I think there's, there's sort of two questions here. The first question um, has to do with uh, whether the religion violates natural law, right? Um, and of course, we can disagree about which, uh, which practices violate natural law. Um, and so in general, I will accept that, yes, of course, their ordinary morality is going to place um, some kinds of constraints on what religions may be tolerated, although I take that to be uh, compatible with even the most... Um, um, the most liberal conceptions of natural law. Um, so yes, I mean, you're going to have to have some states issuing uh, restrictions on religion, but that's, I think, going to be kind of in the name of natural law, right? And pure natural law state without established religion seems to me it could do 
precisely that. So yeah, I mean, religious liberty definitely has uh, limitations, um, but I'm not sure that will make the state establishmentarian. Well, but sorry, just to follow up on that, I mean, you could have a situation like uh, Locke advances in his uh, letter on toleration, in which he essentially says, look, you can have total religious liberty, people can just practice uh, and be committed to the religion that suits them. Um, uh, and and the only thing the state is going to outlaw is whatever they might do um, that's legal in any uh, illegal in any case. So you know, a, a religious community that wants to take a, a, an illegal drug, for example, um, as part of their ritual, the state might outlaw that, um, but not because it's part of the ritual, but because it's illegal in any case. But then, of course, Locke says in the same letter, well. Um, in times of famine, those religious groups that uh, sacrifice animals uh, and to their gods, the state could could prohibit that at least for a time if there's a food shortage to make sure that there's enough meat to go around. Well, then you've already got a situation where the state is able to uh, to allow or prohibit religious practices for temporal reasons by its own lights. Well, if you've got a liberal state that thinks, for example, that um, teaching that homosexuality is immoral, for example, uh, it, it already thinks that, it already s sees that to be the case under its own hate crime legislation, then I don't see how on Lockean reasoning, um, which seems to be co-natural with your own reasoning, uh, the state can't step in and outlaw preaching against homosexual practices, for example. And then what you've already got is the state operating as a counterfeit magisterium, which seems to be pretty much the situation we've ended up in anyway. It, it is time to move to your questioning, ah. Kevin, but I'm sure you want to say, oh. but, but I, would just, I would just add, uh, add to this. I mean, you know, the, the question is, is, as I hear it here, is you, do you have to have church and state establishment to outlaw things, say like same sex marriage and to call that marriage or to outlaw abortion. That is can't, can't, is, is it natural law enough, right? And so, I didn't take that to be Sebastian's point. Now that's the point I'm adding to his, oh, you to are. his question. I mean, I oh, think- Do we so, have more time so, for me to answer? Or? So, yeah. yeah, why don't you answer it and move um, on into your, your, your question. So when, when I hear the word toleration, I think of toleration is something you do to something you don't like and you don't approve of. Yeah. So the minute you have the public-private distinction, you don't really have religious freedom because when Dignitatis Humani talks about religious freedom, I mean, I think mean the, the right yeah. and duty to live out your faith in society, that's going to mean hospitals, it's going to mean adoption agencies, education, schools, how well, I act I in the public square. I actually wanted to um, address something that uh, Sebastian said and, that and I, I, think, I think a lot of people will find interesting. Um, so I actually agree with integralists that when Christ came to earth that he claimed all of religion for himself, okay, and that it, it has become a supernatural good. Um, and that means that every society that the church does not authorize to promote religion does so illicitly if they, if they try to restrict religion. So actually, say on a view like Thomas Pink's, it's a very strong foundation for religious liberty. Um, the difference between, say, me and the integralist is that I'm, I'm not sure how the church is supposed to authorize the state to act in its stead when I don't think that the church has the natural uh, authority or power um, to use physical coercion. Um, so I think, for instance, with integralists, that the state is a polity and that the church is a polity. They're natural to us in a certain way, and the church is in a certain way supernatural to us, maybe for lack of a better term. Um, so, I mean, what I want to say about this is um, uh, that the, the sort of... Um, the goods of religious liberty uh, can be grounded in a number of different ways, um, but even... Even today, even in Catholic states, to get to the point where you would have strong establishment of a religion, um, you would have to get the church and the state back uh, to being willing to have some sort of integralist relationship. And given dignitatis humanae, um, that's extremely unlikely, or at least very far in the future when historical circumstances would be totally 
uh, different. Willingness and capacity, intellectual and otherwise. Yeah, I mean, it's say, really, yeah. it really matters, I think, that Christ has claimed the good of religion because it takes it out of the hands of every state the church is not authorized. And right now, that is every single state in the world, right? I, so even on a kind of Pinkian um, political theology, uh, there is a really radical right of freedom of religion um, that's grounded in the dignity of the person, precisely because the church has no longer authorizing states to use coercion in matters of faith. Could, could I actually, if... Oh, I think maybe we should... should yeah, we well, look? I was hoping to take that as a first question, because I would like to speak to oh. Dignitatis Humanae at uh, some point. Oh, OK. But anyway, you, you fire ahead and I'll... Oh, oh, sure. I wasn't so sure about uh, uh, firing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so given our conversation ahead of time, um, I thought I did have a question that I thought would be difficult for you, but actually I think it isn't um, now that I know you're not an integralist. Um, uh, but it's a point that we would both disagree with integralists on. And I think it's great for us to sort of say that we have an agreement on this point, so allow this. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you're a, a student of Roger Scruton's, and, you know, I'm uh, a student of Jerry Gauss's, who was a very, in some ways a pretty conservative liberal um, and was a, a considerable Hayekian. And one of the things that Scruton and Hayek both do is make us really skeptical of the project of ideal theory, of being able to identify a kind of transhistorical best regime. Uh, and I see integralism as a kind of project in uh, ideal theory. Um, and you notice that there are many integralists, like both Vermeule and Pink, that do not describe themselves as conservative, and they do so very, very self-consciously. And so I think it's just worthwhile for theologically orthodox Christians to have a chance to reflect on the fact that maybe this whole project of ideal theory is misguided, not just when socialists and liberals do it, mm -hmm. but when um, Christian, uh, Orthodox Christians try to do so in Christ's name. So anyway, I just thought I would ask about what you think the right kind of political epistemology is. I mean, what's the problem, say, with uh, integralist ideal theory? Um, how would you put it, given your own political epistemology? Well, thank you, and I think you and I do very much agree on this. Um, uh, I'm very skeptical of political ideal theory. Um, and uh, and I, uh, one of my criticisms of many expressions of the integralist movement is precisely that it has taken the old historical case for thrown and alter conservatism and it has reduced it to an abstraction and then thrown it into the modernist or late modern arena of competing squabbling ideologies and and therefore take, taken what is essentially i think the as i said the imperative to make disciples of all nations and rendered it ideological and that i think is um not a felicitous outcome so um you know Burke wrote a, Edmund Burke wrote a, a, a book that he never finished, but is uh, a, a wonderful work that no one, very few people at least read, uh, The Abridgment of English History. And in that, he's not in, he's, he's really interested in the transformation of Europe and of the British Isles in particular by Christianity. And, um, he, he never, typical Burke, he never says, you know, here are the principles that the state conform to. He simply describes through his analysis of the historical texts, this miracle that happened where, you know, the Romans who had in many respects, a very, very poor conception of human dignity and human decency, um, underwent this incredible transformation. You know, for, for Burke, the Saxon warlords and the, and the, the barbarians of the north, um, you know, the Frankish, uh, the Frankish warlords becoming these, the knights. Um, and, and, you know, as he says, it, this is an amazing thing because the, the, the chivalric code was a code not written anywhere, it was written on your heart. It was, the chivalric code was about defending the poor and, uh, and protecting uh, the weak and so on. Now, Burke says, of course, um, 
not many knights actually lived up to this. Um, however, what's important is that um, the ideal, to use that word in a different sense, was completely different to what the pagan warlord's ideal was of what it was to be a great man, right? And um, for Burke, what he thinks he's tracing, and he says it explicitly, is the operation of grace in history. And so, you know, my Burkean and Maestrian establishmentarianism is not really a schematic abstract case, but it's a soteriological case. I think that grace has operated in corporate persons down the ages, and the effect of that has been the transformation, as Ezekiel puts it, of hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. And I think that's what grace does. And um, and and the the upshot of that historically was that, however imperfect they were, entire nations uh, confessed belief in um, in Christ and and His transformative power through grace. And out of that arose the hospitals and the universities and all of these uh, amazing achievements of Western civilization. And as a conservative, my, my concern is the defense of my inherited civilization. And that's why I think this case is, is the, the establishmentarian case is of the essence. Is that helpful? Uh, it is. It is helpful. I, I hate that we are uh, probably running low on time. So there, maybe I'll have one more uh, question. You know, reading your book, um, which I got a great deal out of, um, I was left wondering what kind of establishment that you favored. You do say at one point, well, you know, um, um, it's going to be hard to say, and maybe conservatives aren't sort of in the business of being quite so specific. You know, they're not really policy wonks like some liberals are. But I was really hoping that you could give our listeners a, at least some help, right, in terms of a range of things, some of which you might think are are problematic uh, in terms of being maybe too statist in a certain way, or others that are too sort of lax or, or, or not enough. So I just thought that wanted to give you the opportunity to try to sort of lay out so people have a bit of a more concrete sense of your position. Well, well, by doing that, you're asking me precisely to defend an ideal, which uh, I'm not sure I have. Uh, the, 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 the first thing to say is that the, those kinds of ambiguities are ones that I'm completely comfortable with, because I think that the relationship between um, government and, and uh, church establishment is something that is not only worked out and negotiated over a lot of time, but it will differ from nation to nation and from people to people according to their customs and their particular type of law and so on. What I do think, however, and this is something about which I'm prepared to be a bit more specific, is that it's not, it's not simply that human beings need to have a set of beliefs. This, this is m not really about ideas. What humans need is to worship. And they need to worship together. Worship is something that ordinarily is a communal thing. And it takes possession of corporate persons. And that's why you need public liturgy. That's why you need ceremony. That's why you need what Walter Badgett famously called the dignified aspect of government. Um, and if you, don't, if you don't have that, then um, you're going to get pseudo versions of that. Um, and uh, I think that Western society is now absolutely rife with all kinds of weird, uh, frustrated paraliturgical activities. Uh, and, it's, and it's because we have been told that we don't need to worship together, and so we've transposed that impulse onto immature expressions of it. I guess my worry here is that what a lot of people I think are going to want to hear is something other than, say, a, the a theological point, which you make very nicely. They're going to want to say, look, if we have some kind of establishment, what happens to me if I'm the person who's kind of on the outside of that. So is, is there anything that you might want to say, particularly to people that are perpetually religious minorities, that the establishment is somehow going to operate in the world so that their at least basic liberties are protected? 
Well, th this is precisely why I'm very keen to inject into the conversation the public-private religion distinction. I, I, what I don't want is to say that um, uh, that it's public religion all the way down, let's put it that way, um, that uh, the dissenter cannot be a dissenter in his home or cannot teach his children dissent uh, and cannot um, uh, have a place of worship and so on. Um, but that's a very different thing to saying that uh, I, either every, uh, look, here are the options, you, got, you either say, Every religion that suddenly emerges has to in some way be enshrined in the constitution and uh, in the law of the land and so forth, um, which I think isn't going to work. Or you say no religion is going to be enshrined in the constitution and in the law of the land. And m my case has been once you say that, you're going to get some kind of religion anyway taking in. It's just, it's just that that religion isn't going to be honest about it, nor is the state that's, that's been possessed by that religion is going to be honest about it. So uh, what I'm really calling for is an honest conversation about the role of public religion, where it can operate in the state. But pr I've precisely homed in on this notion of the private-public distinction because I do think that people's private religious liberties must be uh, protected and respected. So yeah, let's explore that public religion, private religion distinction, because on an ordinary uh, hearing of it, you it sounds like liberalism <laughs> saying, oh, we should kind of keep religion to ourselves or something along those lines. And that, of course, isn't what you mean, right? You would allow all of these different faiths to have some kind of, of public expression in terms of the public sphere, yeah. right? So by public uh, religion, do you mean like religion of state? Yes, I'm talking about enshrinement in the constitution and law. And the effective enshrinement, not just the words, but yes, yes, yes. real practice. Absolutely. Okay, so then I guess I'm wondering what you think about the establishment clause in the US. I mean, you know, I think it's actually worked out fairly well for a long time, even if you think we have some kind of woke-like thing going on now. I mean, it's not really what's gone on in most of American history. And I know you'll say, and many say, that um, there's a sort of sort of established Protestantism, but that's a lot less established. Sure. Because tonight I'm wanting to talk about, you know, how much establishment, thinking about whether we need more or less, right, um, than, than you have in many other in many other countries. So I don't really see the fact that we don't have religious establishment as some kind of covert establishment. Um, I think it means we have less establishment than a lot of other countries, that people are able to express their religion in public, even if the state doesn't take sides between them, even if it can't perfectly avoid, if it can't avoid these things entirely, right? I mean, no one who believes in, say, liberty or equality or even neutrality thinks the state can be perfectly free or perfectly equal or perfectly neutral. But it does seem to me like, actually, we do pretty well. We have lots of public sphere religion, lots of private religion, not much state religion, and that seems to me to actually be working fairly well um, overall the course of American history? Well, um, uh, I'm less optimistic about that. It, it, it seems to me that America, uh, the United States of America, has a, a history of uh, establishmentarian states, um, that the federal imposition of irreligiosity has coincided with the kind of religious frustration that I've been trying to describe in the West. Um, and, you know, it, whilst your republic is a, is a noble and admirable one, it's a very young one. Um, it's, 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 it's very young. Um, for, for a European, it's still in its infancy. And, uh, and this has, um, uh, th this one religious, or pseudo-religious frustration that I've described has emerged rather quickly in the in the history of of this um, of this state, um, and uh, two uh, the the various religions that do have a public expression now. Um, have been rapidly colonized by the political commitments of, um, of, of, of the state. And those um, moral and political commitments are largely, in my view, pseudo-religious.
And that's why it's so important that they colonize uh, d denominations. I mean, just walking here, I, I passed, um, I think, one of the largest churches I saw in the, in the city, and it's got uh, the, the rainbow flag, the trans flag, it's got every ideological, fashionable flag um, uh, waving outside it, but no, no flag with a cross on it. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, until the 18th century, every European flag had a cross on it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, and I think it's very interesting, actually, that the ideological movements of our own age have adopted flags. I mean, fl flags are, um, flags and banners are uh, either signs of national uh, political commitment, or they are um, religious processional. Yeah, transcendent uh, allegiance yeah. there. To uh, so sure. so th this is all indicative for me that um, m my case about religious establishment is largely vindicated precisely because of the American situation. I think we, we need to move to our closing thoughts, gentlemen. Um, Sebastian Morello. Dr. Morello will go first, and Kevin, you will, you will close. And as much as I'd like to say something about the age of the American Republic and refute that <laughs> statement, we'll save that for dinner. Fine. Uh, and uh, uh, so, please. Shall I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay, well, um, it seems to me that before we attempt to answer this practical and prudential question of should religion and government be separate, we need to answer the speculative question uh, of can religion and government be separate? And that's really um, the, the question that troubles me. Paradoxically, I think the more avowedly irreligious or a-religious a country claims to be, the more religious it is in fact. Just listen to the following lyrics. You pushed away the severe storm you made us believe. We cannot live without you. Our lands cannot exist without you. Our future and our hope depend on you. Even if the world changes hundreds of times, people believe in you. Now, these are not the lyrics of an evangelical Christian song about Jesus Christ. This is a North Korean anthem about Kim Jong-il. Human beings will always worship, and that impulse to worship will always find expression at the political level. Either, then, the government will endorse and safeguard conceptions of religiosity that are chaotic and idolatrous and thus corrosive and immoral, or it will endorse religiosity that results in a genuine moral unity of the state's members. The only reason why we assume that the political arena can be secular or religiously neutral is because the West, in the West, we were until comparatively recently a Christian people. Christianity had claimed that political leaders could not ordinarily possess competence to interpret its doctrines or diffuse the means of sanctification, and hence it required apostles and their successors. Ever since we abandoned the Christendom model of religion's connection to politics, we have entered a long epoch of competing ideologies. These ideologies always rest on whatever is deemed to command our deepest and most profound longings. At times, ideologies have rested on vague notions of progress and the universal brotherhood of humanity. At other times, they have been based on more concrete objects like nationhood or ethnicity. More recently, new ideologies have focused on promises of accumulated commodities and the satisfaction of sexual yearning. Every single one of the muddled ideological systems that have informed the structure and direction of the state in recent centuries has been nothing more than a counterfeit religion of a people claiming to be on the path to irreligiosity. No sooner will a government claim to be religiously neutral than it will adopt the most fanatical doctrines and practices, as is widely observable today in the post-Christian victim worship of Western countries and their adoption of paraliturgical processions and months of festivity in celebration of sexual depravity. 
Moreover, governments will claim powers of encroachment and intrusion hitherto considered unthinkable, treating as heretics those who do not endorse its new religiosity in public and now increasingly in private. Just as Christians were persecuted by religious governments for their private practice of their own religion in the church's early centuries, so too are Christians beginning to be persecuted by allegedly religiously neutral governments today. In many, West, in many instances in the West, moral judgments based on theocentric or natural law conceptions of human flourishing have already become criminal offences. The coalescing of persecution advanced by private organisations at the behest of the state with rising identity-based hate crime legislation to rout dissenters from our midst has fully revealed the fiction of secular or neutral politics. Granted, there is arguably a moral duty for states to coerce and punish in defence of what they judge to be the overarching truth of human existence and flourishing. My only point is that we should at least be honest about this. As a Christian, I can tell you which religion I deem to be both true and the fulfilment of all religion, natural and supernatural. But... As a trained philosopher, it is not for me to tell political communities which religion their governments should enshrine in their constitutions, what the public role of clerics and preachers should be, or anything else. All I can do is analyse the state of affairs put before me, and it is demonstrable and observable that secularism exists only as an abstraction in the mind. The disintegration of the West due to ill-fated secularist projects has escalated and accelerated to such a degree that the jury remains out on whether Occidental civilization will survive the century. We need to start being honest again about the place of religion in political and public life, and then we can begin to have a mature conversation about how to negotiate its role. Thank you. Well, so, so again, thanks to you both, I think a lot of really interesting issues came up. So I'll just start by restating my, my position, right? Total religious freedom in public life for citizens, um, legislators as well, so long as they observe the constraints and, uh, of natural law. I haven't argued against symbolic establishment, right? Um, but I have argued that moderate establishment probably isn't very effective um, and that strong establishment is unjust. And I don't think that either of the, any of those claims have been challenged in a plausible way. Um, as far, I mean, we didn't get to talk about dignitatis humanae, I understand, but I see uh, that strong establishment still seems to create really serious problems uh, for groups like religious minorities, but also in terms of the violation of our dignity. There wasn't any real challenge on the points of moderate establishment in terms of the empirical literature. In fact, as I can tell, the main objection that Sebastian has run is what I call the no alternative objection. But as I pointed out, this objection, I think, is critically ambiguous. We have to know what kind of establishment we're talking about, right? But there are many kinds. And we have to know what kind of religion or ideology we're talking about. And there are many kinds. And so I don't see any way to take the no alternative objection to task because I don't know how to make these claims less vague and more specific. And this unwillingness to be specific, I think is a problem because many people who say, oh, I want to hear the case for establishment of religion. What does that mean for me? right? Um, I don't think we came away with good answers to those questions. I still have trouble understanding exactly what the range of acceptable establishment is. So what I want to conclude then is I think my position remains pretty strong, not just on moral principle and our empirical social science, but um, the mind of where the church is today. Well, Dr. Kevin Valley, Dr. Sebastian Morello, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're not going to solve this today. <laughs> we haven't, but it's certainly been a, a pleasant dialogue and a pleasant debate, and I appreciated talking to you both about this, and I look forward to further conversation, in fact. So I'm Dr. John Panero. Thank you for joining us here at the Acton Institute.